The theme of today's talk is really hope versus reason and, and sometimes the almost religious uh, fervour of families uh, and their belief in natural medicines over, over big pharma medicines uh, versus uh, the lack of evidence that, we've, we're, that I'm going to show you, uh, the real lack of evidence we've got about how to use uh, these compounds in, uh, in children with epilepsy. And I, you know, I think that means that families are, are perceiving doctors now as being sort of confused and, and lost in a smoky purple haze, you know, unable to, um, to move forward with this, why aren't you treating my child? Um, and so they're getting on and doing it for themselves. So I'm hoping uh, at the end of the session you'll have, I'll arm you a little bit with some, some uh, tools to try and counter that. But I think it's, it's, it is a, uh, it's a way that's hard to stop at the moment, particularly in certain uh, parts of northern New South Wales and, and Queensland. So, so how do we get here? You know, five years ago, if I said I'm going to um, give uh, uh, you know a one-year-old cannabis, I'd be I'd be put you know I'd be taken off the uh, off the I'd be deregistered essentially. So we've gone from something from a few a few years ago it was just unthinkable to suddenly why aren't you doing it? Do it now. You know, what, you know, doc, you know you're you're withholding these important medicines from my child, doctor. A massive change in just a few years. Um, and so th we're going to talk briefly about the, the, um, what led us to this point and then I'm going to show you the very little evidence that there is um, and then the final part of the talk is really how the current laws in Australia, how, what does that mean for us as prescribers and, and really a how-to guide on how to prescribe cannabis. Um, and so as a, um, th this, is one of the, this is probably the biggest problem facing us is that, and this not only applies to, to this issue but really many issues in medicine, is it's very hard to argue with uh, the internet. And so this is Charlotte Figgy, who's really the poster girl. And, and, and whenever you, uh, the, the thing about these poster children who've had a great success with cannabis is they keep getting recycled. So this, she's been, she gets put up every few, every um, month. You'll see a new story about her saying the great success, and you, and you do see a theme of the of of uh, the same children being recycled. So Charlotte lived in Colorado, um, in Denver, Colorado, and had uh, a condition called Dravet's syndrome, which is a severe childhood epilepsy. And the family, frustrated, went down to their local um, cannabis dealer and said, try this uh, high cannabidiol uh, substance. And she had significant improvement. Um, uh, and look, you see pictures like this all over the web. Unfortunately, she still has epilepsy, of course. She's not cured in any, in any sense. And it's very hard to know exactly how good she is. but. Certainly, anecdotally, she got be she got better, and we've got uh, you know children in every state of Australia who've got similar stories. The other the other so that's, that's the internet. The other important thing this is this is enormous business, and so people are talking about it being like banana republics in South America. So companies are buying up great swathes of rainforest, chopping them down, and planting cannabis plants. And so this is ver so you've got to be very cautious about what's driving this whole process. Not only the um, you know the broader legalization of marijuana, but this is this is a multi-billion dollar business um, driving this, and there's certainly some players in Australia uh, who are part of that. And, and the other factor is that most people support this. Um, so uh, plenty of surveys would say that uh, medical marijuana is a safe and a useful thing, and why aren't we doing it? And and part of that is because a lot of us have got personal experience and. I want everyone just to get, hopefully they all had a drink at lunchtime, so we just need a sample from everybody on the way out. Um, <laughs> just to, yeah, no, it's not, not funny. Uh, so what we're going to do, <coughs> <coughs> serious, just, um, just to see how many of you have, uh, have uh, smoked cannabis in the last few months. But a lot of us have. I haven't, not last time I had a cup. <laughs> just, just lie, I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> not for a while. So, so it's interesting that uh, extremely well-educated families won't trust me or won't trust you guys, um, but we'll, we'll trust someone like Tony here who, um, who runs one of the biggest distributors of uh, medical cannabis in Australia. And so um, it, it re it's really hard to understand, really, uh, why, why that is the case. But, it's, um, but the, one, of the, one of the issues with uh, you know, homegrown or artisanal cannabis is, well, there are many issues, but when it, when it has been tested, it can contain all sorts of substances. 
Um, in, in particular, many of the many of the samples that get collected don't have any cannabis in it at all, and they might just be uh, full full alcohol. Things that are labelled as CBD, CBD might have loads of, of uh, tetrahydrocannabinol in it, um, moulds, pesticides, all sorts of uh, contaminants, as you would expect. But don't worry, you can trust him. Look, he's well-meaning. He's a well-meaning fellow, I'm sure, and as as many of the people in the area. But um, but it's not the same as uh, as a pharmaceutical product. So just taking it back a step, the, and you may you may know some of this, but the two main uh, there, you know there are hundreds of compounds in a cannabis plant, and and that is a problem because as we knock off each one and say it doesn't work, someone's going to say, well, what, have you tried this this part? So it's going this story will run for quite a long time. Um, so THC is the stuff that makes us high. It's um, it's the it's the major component of of the, of the standard standard cannabis plant, um, and uh, it's the part that makes you high and, and paranoid. In in animal models um, uh, for the last you know 20, 20 years or so, it's been used to see if it can treat epilepsy, and it's in some animal models it does improve epilepsy. Um, uh, but in some, it can make epilepsy worse. And if you talk to adult doctors. Uh, who uh, see epilepsy all the time, they'll say you know, many of their patients uh, smoke marijuana and before this came out, none of them used to say it had any benefit for them. So they were very sceptical that there would be any, any role for this at all. Importantly, THC, there are you know, clearly some issues in adults, but, but there are particular issues uh, about risks, uh, increased risk of psychosis, dependence, the gateway drug, uh, um, and, and really effects on neurodevelopment completely unknown in children. So as, as a compound, it, it, we're certainly not wanting to use anything like that. On the, uh, but it is being used in a lot of medical uh, cannabis problems, problems uh, uh, disorders for, uh, you know, for other reasons, and that's partly because it's quite cheap. So cannabidiol is the, is, is the main uh, cannabinoid under study at the moment, um, and it's, it can be present, present in sort of 1% or 2% of the standard uh, cannabis plant. What people talk about is that the combination, you know, in street cannabis, um, if you've got something that's very high in THC and low in CBD, then you're more likely to be sort of agitated and, and paranoid. So CBD is meant to sort of be more of a calming uh, component to, to, uh, to standard street cannabis. Um, but when used uh, by itself, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, when uh, patients, when they're asked about it, will say, and in fact, drug, drug users who are asked about the effect on them, they'll say it has no effect at all. They don't, don't they feel nothing. It's not. It's got very low addiction potential. Um, so it has been studied for 20 years or so in animal models, and it's shown to be quite effective uh, in a whole range of animal models as an anticonvulsant, and, that, and that's led to its uh, to the uh, trials in humans. What we don't we know a, a bit about short-term effects in um, in animals um, and in in humans, but no one knows about long-term effects, um, and that's an important message for families as well um, about that. And also also because it's a small component uh, of the cannabis, it's more expensive to you know you've got to grow a lot more to extract uh, extract that. So generally, if you're getting um, any of the government's warehoused cannabis products, anything that's high THC is quite cheap, but anything that's very high in the CBD, which we're looking at for children, is, um, is, uh, is much more expensive. So governments across, New across Australia have, have been trying to address this, particularly on the eastern seaboard. So New South Wales is a bit of a leader and announced three trials uh, in December 2014. Um, basically, they put three million dollars uh, into into three areas: paediatric epilepsy, palliative care, and chemotherapy. And all those trials are up and running to various degrees of success. Simil there's a similar thing happening in Brisbane. Um, uh, they've got a compassion access scheme for paediatric epilepsy, and Victoria has um, has uh, a scheme where they've just bought uh, enough cannabis for uh, for uh, 30 patient th 30 paediatric patients. Other states have done uh, nothing as yet because it costs money. Um, but essentially what we need to do is find a pharmaceutical product, and that's very difficult. And the, really the only one that was uh, very advanced at the time is, is GW Pharma. Too late, the shares have already gone from um, you know, 50 cents up to about $5,000 so <laughs> per each, so too late to invest. Um, uh, and, um, but essentially what, what, what you're getting is still a plant-derived uh, uh, com uh, compound, um, but uh, made to good manufacturing uh, standards, which means that every bottle's got the same uh, amount in it. There's no batch-to-batch uh, -batch variation. Uh, they've tested it. They've, you know, they've tested it on, on gastro gastrostomy tubes. They've tested it on on rats and you know pregnant monkeys and all sorts of things. Um, and so it's, it has a. It really is just a very much like a standard pharmaceutical product. And so luckily they agreed to supply supply uh, our initial trials, and that's how it comes. Um, 
and an uh, interesting mix of, uh, at the moment, it's still got a fair bit of ethanol. They're working on trying to remove that. Um, but it's 98% cannabidiol, a very small amount of THC, really negligible. Um, the sesame oil, uh, you, I wonder what it, I haven't tasted it, of course, um, but it's a you know, mix of sesame oil, strawberry, and, and grass. So I don't, I'm not sure what that would taste like. Um, okay. And so, uh, so essentially, we were fortunate enough that, and this has taken you know, a fair bit of money, New South Wales government uh, supported this, uh, and it, we've, we've got uh, now treated about 57 children in, uh, in New South Wales with drug resistant epilepsy. Um, and we've just got approved for another 26 doses, so we'll, we'll, um, we're just starting to get some... Some of those have been up on it now for nearly 12 months, um, and I can tell you just a little bit about that, uh, about the outcomes. So the uh, essentially what we uh, tried to do was to... Because of the demand is really, you know, if you look at, say, population New South Wales, there's probably, um, you know, over 1,000 children who might be, uh, you know, getting close to 2,000 children who might have drug-resistant epilepsy. We we only had 40 doses, so we had to r make it very uh, strict in terms of who could get it, and so that included children who had been hospitalised, had seizures that you couldn't so frequent that you couldn't count them, and um, and had failed more than five medicines. Um, and so, just to just to uh, briefly, uh, just to uh, those the, one of the problems about the trial is because the patients are so sick, we haven't been able to um, sort of keep seizure diaries and counts, but but. The, the probably the key message has been pretty disappointing. Um, uh, there's there's out of those uh, 60 or so kids, we've got one who is seizure free, um, and that's fairly short term. Um, the majority of them uh, are, have not been helped. Um, the side effects um, I'll, I'll talk to, to you about a little bit. Generally mild and reversible, but uh, but still significant. Um, but generally a fairly dis disappointing result. And um, so, uh, you know, I think that's an important message for families, and I've, I've been saying that to families now, that they, you know, if they want to spend a couple of grand a month on, on buying their own um, cannabidiol products, I'm really counselling against that, saying that the, the benefits are very limited at the moment and, uh, and um, very small chance of success. But watch this space because these are only uh, these are open label trials, and, and and so the next sort of phase is a number of trials are being done by GW, um, and this is the ones that we're involved with in, at um, uh, at uh, in Sydney, uh, looking at tuberous sclerosis and also Dravet syndrome, uh, and that and they're double blind RCTs, and so there there are other compounds, and we're hoping to start this trial. Uh, early next year in uh, in girls with Rett syndrome, again looking at their epilepsy. The, this this has been looked at in Rett animal uh, in Rett rat models, and and the uh, cannabid cannabidovarin uh, has improved the epilepsy of those rats, but also improved their their social skills and also some of their um, motor therapies stereotypies of the rats of, uh, as well. So it'll be interesting to see if it does that for the children. Um, right, we'll see there. So this this trial is worth having a read a read of because it's a it's a landmark study and it's the um, just published in May uh, and it's the first uh, really well designed uh, double blind randomised control trial of of cannabidiol uh, using the Epidiolex product of GW um, and and so what this this used 120 children in US and European centres uh, and they had a four week baseline period versus a um, and then looked at a 14 week double blind period using a dose of 20 per kilo per day um, and the average age of these children was uh, was 10 years and they're a very severe group you know half of them had severe to profound uh, d um, intellectual disability and, and the rest had mild to moderate and, and pretty amazing seizure frequency. So one of the patients had 1,700, was averaging 1,700 seizures per month. I don't know how they got in really, because how do you count that? But on average, the, um, they, on average they're having about um, three or four convulsive seizures uh, per week, which is still uh, a, lot of, a lot of convulsive seizures. And the results showed that in that group, in the, in the uh, patients treated, um, they had a, on, on a median 40% reduction in, in their seizures. So that means, um, you know, for an individual patient, if they're having you know ten seizures a month, that dropped down to six. So that was the average average effect. Now, in reality, if that was your child, that's not an, not an enormous benefit. It is a benefit, but not but not enormous. Um, and if you look at the placebo, there was quite a placebo response as well. On on average, about a a fifteen percent reduction um, in those who were getting placebo. Um, an important message from this trial is that those who did get benefit got it very quickly. So if there are families who are um, you know, wanting to trial uh, medicinal cannabis uh, and pay for it themselves, um, then you could say that look, we could give you, know, you could just spend a couple of grand just for the month and see if that if that is of any benefit because you should see that benefit fairly quickly. 
So again, from this trial, um, and this was an, um, so if you look at um, another way of analysing the data was saying how many of them had a more than 50% reduction. And so this is, you know, this, this shows you that most of the group did not have, uh, you know, did not get a 50% reduction in their seizures. So in the, in the CBD group, about 40% of them had a 50% reduction in seizures. And in the placebo group, one in four got a greater than 50% reduction in seizures. So that was, um, and three of those patients uh, in the CBD became seizure free. So again, a large number of, uh, a lump, large number of the patients were, uh, did not get, uh, get a benefit. And there's a question mark about that group on the CBD. Was it some of the other medicines they were on? That there's, there, there's a few questions about the data that have not been resolved yet. And so this is the only this is the only trial that really has shown um, the only trial that's been reported so far that's shown a benefit. And I suppose the results are modest. You know, they're not they're not dramatic, but it is a very difficult group. Um, now to the adverse events. You know, so in the in the uh, in the drug trial group about. Um, uh, you know, more than 10% had to withdraw because of adverse events, and those the most common things were gastrointestinal. So, um, a number got di uh, got diarrhoea, vomiting, weight loss, um, and and because of that had to come out of the trial. Sleepiness was very common, um, particularly if they were also on the drug clobazam, so or frisium, and so and that's because it's now recognised that the cannabidiol interferes with clobazam and pushes the levels of uh, up very high. Um, and so that can be countered by reducing it or ceasing clobazam. There's a question mark about whether uh, seizures were worsened in a small group. So 11% uh, in, um, in the CBD group had a worsening of seizures versus 5% placebo. And the other one just to watch out for in your patients, particularly those who are, who are using... Um, um, who are you know using either illegal or legal means uh, is you probably should check their liver function tests because um, in particularly if they're on valproate because they're fairly uh, fairly high rates um, so anywhere between sort of uh, five and twenty percent of uh, of children getting cannabidiol and or cannabis and um, uh, and also on valproate will have uh, high um, elevations of the liver function tests that often can resolve when you stop the valproate. So it certainly is not a, not a miracle, and it's not it's not entirely safe. It behaves like a drug. There are there are side effects, and they're all short term. We don't know about long term. So over the next twelve months, we're going to we'll hear more. Uh, the Lennox there's two Lennox Gasto trials, uh, which is you know severe um, severe epilepsy with drop attacks and um, and mixed seizures, and that's going to report over the next twelve months. Another Dravo, another Dravo trial, which we're involved in, and hopefully we'll hear some more. But there's a whole range of trials that are coming out, and we'll get some more information in the next twelve months. But despite all this evidence, will families be satisfied? And look, uh, already, you know, uh, when I, uh, I think this sort of sort of comes up again, you know, that this, this is big pharma. You know, what what we should be using is you know homegrown stuff. Um, those, those sort of arguments, those natural argument, naturalistic arguments, which are very hard to counter. And people will say, look, you know, we're using CBD. That's not so good. We should use THCA, or they'll come up with a list of other things. And and really, this is just a, a, almost a Facebook discussion of. Um, of anecdote of anecdotal stuff with and pseudoscience essentially so and so very hard to counter a, a big concern is uh, its use in other conditions uh, you know the autistic spectrum disorder group you know they they they're often very early adopters of of um of new technologies and new new treatments and I'm, and, and I'll, you know, I'm sure we've got examples of families who are reporting great effects in their autistic children and with very little evidence so far about that um, and a big worry is in chronic pain. Uh, that, that's a major concern. We'll see another epidemic similar to the, epide the opioid uh, epidemic. So look, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm blabbering on. Um, so the, um, just, just to get back to some practical things. So unfortunately, every couple of months, there's some new headlines saying that doctors can prescribe, and then you get a call from your, from your uh, patient saying, why aren't you prescribing, doc? Um, and so this, is, this has been going on, and, and, and we're supported by the politicians, but also by um, including the TGA saying, look, we've made it easy. You know, why, you know, why aren't doctors prescribing? Um, and one of, the, one of the problems that is still very confusing um, and, uh, and uh, the, some of the major changes mean um, that uh, the, probably the most recent change is, that, is the warehousing of, of approved products, so meaning that, you don't, that there are a number of products which if you look up the website, the Office of Drug Control can tell you uh, um, about those products. They're, they're approved, meaning there's, there's a little bit of data to support that they're, they're not, not very little data to support their um, any efficacy, but to saying at least that what's written on the bottle is is uh, is what's in the bottle, and and um, but otherwise it's still your responsibility. 
Um, and so, look, I'm going to skip because I know time's running short. So this is what you, this is what you do. So you, if if you do want to prescribe uh, a cannabinoid, you've got to select you've got to select your patient. So you've got to um, just and this is what you have to justify to the TGA. Essentially, is you're choosing somebody who has got drug you know that that has failed uh, routine medications and um, uh, and has got severe enough epilepsy. To then then have to choose your compound or supplier. That's made a little bit easier by the um, by the the Office of Drug Control. Um, if you work at a hospital, you need. If you want them, uh, if you want the hospital to fund that, then you'll have to go to your hospital drug committee. And I'm not, I'm not aware of that happening so far. It is happening for some of the um, in palliative care. The hospital drug committees have approved a couple of products for for um, patients in palliative care, but I'm, I haven't heard that in in uh, childhood epilepsy. Um, if you wanted to prescribe anything that contained anything other than pure cannabidiol, you have to get your local. Uh, state health department, and um, but if you've got if you're just prescribing as uh, cannabidiol alone um, in New South Wales and Queensland, I think most of the other not maybe not every state, but you, you don't have to you don't have to get approval from your state health department in most states. So then you just can do a, 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 an application directly to the TGA, which is the standard category B form, um, uh, or you uh, and that's that's the most the thing that's most applicable here. Um, and then and you have to basically com contact the company um, and and then write a script and the company uh, and the script can just go to the private um, go to the private uh, f um, uh, pharmacy and the company will arrange that once payment is made now the payment's the thing that's not, not ever mentioned uh, so the current so for an average sort of um, 20 30 kilo child sort of getting a you know an average dose of 10 to 20 uh, milligrams per kilo per day that cost will be something of the order of um, two grand a month to the family so it really puts it out of the um, out of the range of most people when people are bringing stuff in they're paying uh, uh, something you know some of the uh, local suppliers are something around 500 to a thousand dollars a month but um, for the for the stuff that's sort of TGA approved that's um, that's getting around, you know. Well, if you've got a bigger person, you know, it's up to four thousand dollars a month. So, very. That's probably the major limiting factor, which we've not heard uh, anything about in the media. Um, so, who pays? Uh, and th and so, I, I have prescribed. I've gone. I've done this a couple of times for some well, basically wealthy and desperate families. Um, uh, and one of those feels it's working, and one is um, was hospitalised soon afterwards and came off. Um, and uh, and so, th there's a real issue there about patient safety, and also. If you're prescribing, what what um, you know your safety in terms of your your um, medical legal liability as well. You know, if you if you prescribe this, are you acting within a normal framework? Are you seeking appropriate uh, advice? Are you really the right person to do this? And um, and that's that's a major problem. All right, thanks very much.